Sitting tall, close the eyes. And just take these moments to connect with yourself. Connect with the inhale, the exhale, the feeling of the breath in the body. Connect with whatever it is that you sense in this moment. Notice how your physical body feels. Notice any sensations that are present. Notice how your energetic body feels. Whatever sensations are present with that. Notice the condition of your mind. Notice the condition of your intellect in this moment. And then finally, notice the condition of your joy, your inner peace and happiness. Don't judge anything that you find. Just be aware of it. Let it be what it is. And allow yourself to understand that it's going to change. Quickly, slowly, somehow, in every way. It's going to just keep changing. Because that's what this experience of our humanness does. And allow that understanding to bring some peace to your heart. Breathing in and breathing out. Connect with yourself on all levels. And on your next exhale, draw the hands together in front of the heart. And we'll lift our voices in one ohm and the invocation mantras. Taking a breath in. Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Ganana antwa ganapati gum hava mahe kavin kavinam upama shravastamam jesta rajam brahmanan brahmana spata anashrin vanu ti besida sadhanam maha ganapataye namaha Prano Devi Saraswati Vaje Bhir Vajini Vati Dhinama Vitriya Vatu Ano Devo Brahataf Parvata Da Saraswati Ajata Gantu Yagnyam Havan Devi Jujushana Kritachi Shagmam No Vacha Mushati Shrinotu Vagdevyai Namaha And gently release the hands down, flutter the eyes open. Welcome. Good to see you all today. Absolutely. Do you have questions? What do you want to talk about today? <laughs> no thoughts? No? So wherever I go is good. Are you sure? Okay. If you have a question, now it's time. Savannah. Can you talk about, maybe just a little bit, about self-trust? Certainly. Of course. Absolutely. So what is trust? What is trust? um, I don't want to put on thought and tired and have to yoga. (laughs) (laughs) You can say pass. Um, 
I think it's just believing in belief. Belief okay. in something, yourself. Okay. What is trust? Along the lines of belief, um, I would say having faith in something and feeling a sense of safety. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is trust? Resting in something. Resting in something. Mm-hmm. Okay. What is trust? Believing that whatever the situation is, that the outcome is the way that it is supposed to be. Okay. It's great answers, <laughs> by the way. Really great answers. Give me a lot to work with. Yes. Okay, so first of all, when I was in graduate school, um, I went up to one of my advisors, a lovely woman named Christy Rockwell, Dr. Christy Rockwell. Um, she's a physical anthropologist. Uh, she studied a lot of DNA type of stuff, atomic type of stuff. And I went up to her, and I was talking to her about some results that I had just gotten from some research I did. And I said, I believe, and she stopped me cold. She said, no, you don't. I said, don't what? She said, you do not believe. You do not believe. Belief is for fairy tales. She said, the facts show the, the, the information you have gathered indicates. So, so I, I kind of walked away from that, that conversation like, hmm, okay. And so number one, faith is not belief. Belief, to believe in something is in fairy tales. And what always happens in fairy tales in the end? It always works out exactly the way you want it to, right? She gets the guy, he gets the girl, you know, the bad one gets demolished somehow, right? So, so we don't go that route with faith. Faith is not believing. Faith is knowing. It's a knowing. And it's a knowing that actually goes beyond the ability to collect data, You know, you can base some aspect of your trust and faith in what you know. But the second point with all of this is that oftentimes what we think we know aligns in a really kind of interesting way with what we want to know. Right? And what we want to know often aligns with our ego. We come into a situation where trust is based in allowing my ego to get what it wants. It wants to be safe. It wants to never be lied to. It wants the truth, well, unless it doesn't, right? Yeah. So, so that our trust and our faith is often organized around what we want to believe it represents, something we have to be really careful of. Because in the tradition, what trust is, Is as and many of you said it, but I think you meant something a little bit different by it. Having faith that something is going to happen. What something? Something could be anything. That something is going to happen and that it will be aligned with the greater good. Even if it doesn't seem to be at first. And the ego hates that. It says, nope, nope, nope. Partner always has to tell me the truth, unless I don't want to hear it. Yeah. The uh, circumstances in life always have to work out so that I'm kept safe, but who's ever safe? Like, we're sitting here right now having this really great conversation, and you know, a comet could come from outer space, and boom, there goes the ashram. What do we know? You know, we're ne- we, we, we can never say we're safe. 
in respect to the outside world. The only place that we can say we're safe is where? Within ourselves. So where does trust begin? In yourself. Absolutely. Trust starts from within the self to yourself. And in order to know that trust, you have to be willing to know yourself. Otherwise, the ego jumps in and says, well, your ability to trust depends on that one over there and that over there and the fact that a comet is not going to land on this ashram right now and all these other things that are outside of you. But the fallacy there is you have no control over those things. Zero. Literally. And we don't like that. Like the ego doesn't like that. The ego says, no. I want control over everything that comes within my, my 18 inches of personal space, you know, but we don't, we don't. So trust cannot be based on that which we cannot control in that, in that kind of a way, expecting to have a sense of assuredness, 100%, you know, this is the way it's going to be. And anything that violates that is, is going to violate my trust. It's, not, it's just not plausible. It's not maintainable in any way, shape, or form. And so instead, in the tradition, what we say is, I have faith in God. I have trust in God. I have trust in, in, in that consciousness. And, and that's, that's a whole different level of trust. To have that trust, you have to have trust in yourself first. So you cultivate relationship with yourself. Who am I? What am I doing here? Why am I alive? What's my purpose in life? What is dharma? What is karma? And you cultivate the ability to accept the responsibility of your own karma. You cultivate the ability to accept the challenges and the ease of your own dharma. You, you cultivate an acceptance of yourself. And in doing so, you're also cultivating trust in that greater consciousness. The consciousness that is responsible for creating the entirety of the universe and beyond. That is the universe itself. Then... Why do bad things have to happen? Well, if we want to look at it on a really simplistic level of, of, of things and, and we just want to have a reason, then the easiest reason is that things that we perceive of as harmful exist because of the gunas, because there is sattva, rajas, and tamas. Period. <laughs> right? So simply the idea that rajas and tamas exist means that not everything is going to be balanced. Mental states will not always be balanced. Emotional states will not always be balanced. Physical states will not always be balanced. Thinking will not always be balanced. Nature will not always be balanced in a way that we perceive balance should be. It's always going to be at conflict with itself. And that conflict will drive some people to be violent. And it will drive others toward peace. And who the hell knows why? Why one person should be driven toward violence because of that internal conflict, and yet another should be driven toward healing. Who knows why? And this is where the trust in that greater consciousness comes in, because it's karma. It's, it's all karma. Now, many of you have heard me say, no, she is not a bitch. That's actually, maybe that's the title of this, this talk today. Karma is not a bitch. Stop calling her that. No, karma is action. That's all karma is. The word karma means action. And actions cause other actions and reactions. Karma is cause and effect. And it's not always negative. That's the way we perceive it. It's not always positive. That's the way we perceive it. It's just what it is. It's action. 
and reaction. It's cause and it's effect. And in the Tatwa uh, Bodha, I believe it is, um, Swami Dayananda said something along the lines of, um, so beautifully he put it, I'm just going to paraphrase it and chop it all up. And he said, the wise one is the one who stands back and witnesses the play of karma. Doesn't get involved because they realize that karma has to play itself out. And at some point it reaches that point of inertia. It reaches the point where it has no more energy and it's done with itself. But the moment you step into it, you give it energy. Whether you step in out of the goodness and greatness of your own heart or out of anger or hate, whatever reason, or out of fear, whatever reason you step into the flow of karma, it is energy that you're giving to it. So the wise one steps back in a passive kind of a way and says, not feeding it, go on, go that way. Yeah. Just doesn't get involved. Now, can we live that way without involvement? No. It's not in our human nature to not be involved. And our, our calling, the compelling for us to be involved in things, is what in some part reinforces that egoic tendency to want to see things work out the way I want them to work out. I mean, hey, I have spent the last 20 years putting 24-7 into building this foundation, into cultivating a space where people can come and feel safe, where you, you have a place to come practice and to come learn, where I can practice and learn, where we can all just be together. And, and of course, I have not spent those 20 years building this for this not to be what I perceive it could be. But is it that to everybody? No, we've been called a cult. We've been called weird. We've been called all kinds of crazy things, you know. Because I, I don't have control over those outside things. So it can't matter so much what it means outside of myself. It, it needs to, I need to have trust in my own inner vision. And in having trust in my own inner vision, I have to have an ear open to what divinity is suggesting, you know. And it's a divine suggestion. So it's not like Shakti's not knocking on my door saying, hey, Swamini, do this. You know, it's, it's closing the eyes. It's being present in the moment. It's having the willingness to listen to that which cannot be heard by the ears. And just to recognize that, you know, there's going to be difficulties. There's going to be months we can't pay the electric bill. There's going to be months we can. There's going to be months where there's a new leak in the roof. Lordy knows there's a lot of those months. Ah, there's going to be months where we're able to get it patched. You know, there's going to be months where things in life don't work out, harm occurs. And then when that harm comes to us, when, when, when we interact with that harm, whatever it happens to be, then don't turn to the harm and say, what do I do with you? Do you see what I'm saying? Because we do that, don't we? We, we look to, to that which impacts us and we say, what am I supposed to do with you? And we trust. We put misplaced trust that it's going to answer us effectively, but it's not. Because harm will only ever lead to more harm. Violence will only ever lead to violence. It will only resolve itself to peace when we step out of it. But as long as we have even a toe in, the, in its waters it will keep going and going and going and going. So we have to step away from it, dissociate a little bit from it. And then we can turn someplace else and say, what do I do with that? What do I do with that? Tell me what I do with that. There is an answer there, but you can't hear it with your ears. You cannot see it with your eyes. You cannot taste it with your tongue. You can only feel it with your heart. And if the ego's interest is so strong, then the heart is difficult to access and trust is difficult to have. Does that make sense? Yeah. I know it's not a straightforward answer, and then it is, you know? So what is trust? 
Trust is the ability to walk through this life in the midst of all that may or may not ever happen, whether it's good, bad, beautiful, ugly, somewhere in between those places. And choose love anyway. Choose to try anyway. Do not allow anything out there in this human-made world to steal from you your capacity to love, your capacity to see the goodness that truly does exist, that is the potential of all of us. And understand that there are some people in this world that are just not going to do that. They're not going to connect with the goodness because they're, it's, they, they don't want to. It's not their time. There's so many ways we can say that, but the reality is they're on a path. Same as we're on a path. Well, why does their path have to involve them hurting people, especially me? Because they haven't learned. They haven't learned how to care yet. They haven't learned how, how to take their own fear and transform it into courage. They have not learned yet how to take their own anger and transform it into patience or compassion. They haven't learned yet the importance of what you're asking about. It doesn't mean they never will. But in the moment that a person perceivably harms you, they have totally forgotten it. It's not their concern. Does that make some sense? I know. It's powerful, isn't it? It's like, wow. It so is. And, and how do we like look at that and be okay with it? Well, it's not really a matter of being okay with it. Being okay with it is like, it's a phrase from the 1960s, hippie complex of the USA and other areas you know, of the world. Everything is cool. You know, it's all okay. Yeah, no, it's not. <sighs> it's really not. It's not okay, and it's not not okay. It's what it is. And yoga teaches us this. Stop thinking in those extremes. It's okay. It's not okay. Or it's okay as in spiritual bypassing, like it's all okay. You know. It's not. It's, it's, it's just what it is and it's a reinforcing of the idea of the work that each and every one of us has to do our own self to heal the bridge of trust within our own self how do we stop looking out you know in my own life and you all those of you who know me know that I speak from my own experience a lot of the time when I was young I had not a good relationship with my mother I wanted one drastically. I mean, I so wanted to have her be the mother that I wanted her to be. And even into my adulthood, I still put myself in harm's way, you know, hoping, just hoping that she would show me that I could trust in that relationship. Yeah. And so every time that she failed me, there was anger. This pissed offedness. Why? Why can't you just be who I want you to be? And then I'm sitting in meditation. I had I had been to India the first time, I guess, and I got back and I was sitting in meditation. I don't remember the circumstances right now. Sometimes it's really clear, and other times it's not. But at any rate, I know we, I was sitting in meditation, and and I wasn't really thinking about anything. Like, I wasn't thinking about my mother. I wasn't thinking about our relationship. I wasn't really thinking about anything. I was just, my eyes were closed and I was just somewhere else. And all of a sudden, it hit me like a baseball bat. Like, seriously. My eyes opened and I started crying my eyes out. And you know what I realized in that moment? My God, how much this woman suffered in her life. That she suffered in ways that I had chosen not to see, chosen not to realize, didn't even know about. I think that the first thought I had was, her heart's been broken too. And then I was like, 
wait a minute, I'm meditating here. This is not the time for this. And then the next thought came and it said, but you know that she was in a hospital bed for a year when she was a teenager at the age of 16. And then all of these things started coming to the front of my mind, one after the other, one after the other, one after the other. And at the end of it, it took about five minutes, if that, maybe, maybe one minute, I don't know. But whatever time it took for all these, these realizations to come to the front of my mind, the concluding thought was, of course she can't be the mother I want her to be. Look at what she has to do in her own life. Oh my God, what have I been asking her for? I've been asking her to force herself to be something she's not capable of being, in the, to me anyway, you know, for whatever reason. And in that moment, I completely forgave her. I'm not saying that you have to go forgive the people who hurt you. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying just be open to when the moment comes when you can. And in the meantime, maybe sit down and and just do an inventory with yourself and say, is what I'm asking for even reasonable? Right? Is it even reasonable? And when we start looking at other people and we start recognizing the hell that they've been living through, we start realizing that maybe the demands that we're putting on them are, are not realistic. And here's the thing. Initially, that might be a little bit disappointing for some. But eventually, you learn how to trust yourself more because you're denying the reality of someone else's existence less. Does that make sense? So the clearer that we can see the truth of the suffering of other beings, the less we deny about this cause and effect stuff, the more we have faith in ourselves, trust in ourselves, because we're seeing more clearly. And you know when you see clearly, and when you accept that you are seeing clearly, You've all had a moment, haven't you, where you've seen clearly and turned in the other direction? Completely, right? We've all done it. And then you spent, I don't know, three weeks or 30 years kicking yourself for it, right? Yeah. And then you also have had those moments where you've seen clearly, accepted it for what it is, and, and there was a lightness there, even if it was a difficult situation. How many of you have had a relationship in your life where you knew you needed to leave it, you knew you needed to leave it, you knew you needed to leave it, and while you were in it, you were like tormented. I'm talking weight on the shoulders and the heart, tears every day, struggle, 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 and then one day came, and that one day came and you said, that's it, I have to go. And there was no weight. It was like a breath of fresh air. It was like the realization of peace within yourself, that you finally trusted yourself. So this trust thing is no small matter. But it's not outside of yourself. Your trust cannot be broken by another person. Not really. Your expectation can be. I expect you to always treat me nicely. I expect you to never lift a finger to hurt me. I expect this from you. And that other person can honor that expectation or they can laugh at it. You don't have control over that. In this tradition, and in my own personal teaching, what I like to call radical self-responsibility, and I know that's like a, that is so not cool in the world today, radical self-responsibility I accept responsibility for everything that has ever happened to me in my life. Everything. Whether it was great or crappy, I accept responsibility for it. I do not accept responsibility for the behavior of other people. That is their responsibility. I accept responsibility for what I do with it. And I understand, vehemently I understand, that there are things that happen circumstances that we find ourselves in that we don't have the tools in that moment to work through. And so my work in that moment is to have patience with myself until I can acquire those tools. To just be in that process of always rediscovering the self. 
the little S self and the big S self. Because the more that we, we look out, and, and I know this is not a popular opinion, but the, the more that we look out and we say, you broke my trust and you broke my trust and you broke my trust and you broke my trust. What accountability do I have for the condition of my own life? I have absolute accountability for the condition of my own life, no matter where I find myself. I have to. If I don't, how is trust in myself even possible? What, what purpose does it serve? If I don't have absolute accountability for my own self, then what hope do I ever have of connecting to and realizing my own dreams, hopes, and aspirations? Does that make sense? Some kind of sense? I'm not saying that obstacles don't exist. Yes, of course they exist. 100% they exist. This world is full of them full of obstacles, and those obstacles are for all kinds of reasons, social injustice, personal preferences, etc., and so on. They're out there, absolutely. And I'm not saying that every single person can, can grow up and be the president. That's a bunch of BS. I'm not saying every single person can grow up and have a, a, a successful business, and that's BS too. But every single person will follow a path in this life. And that path can either be grounded in the idea of ultimate disappointment or grounded in the idea of potential. That's my choice. And you cannot take that away from me. And I cannot take it away from you. If I sit here and tell you, your dreams are silly, it's your choice whether to believe me or not. If, I, if, you allow, if you allow yourself to believe me, you've broken trust with yourself. You've said, I don't have any faith in what I think or feel. So I'm, go I'm going to let your expectations and your words prove that. Does, yeah? Questions or reflections about that? It's hard. I know. It means you have to be radically self-responsible. Somebody comes to you and says, you're not worth it. What do you know? You don't even know your own worth. How can you tell me what my worth is? You don't even know your own. Somebody comes to you and says, your life is on the wrong track. Oh, really? How, how would you know my life is on the wrong tra track? Are you living my dharma? Are, are, you, are you resolving my karma for me? Are you me? In, you know, incognito, are you me? Are you living my life? People have no idea. They just say stuff because they don't like silence. So they say, and they don't say it about themselves. They'll never come very seldom. They, they might once in a blue moon, but very seldom will they come to you and say, my life is on the wrong track. You know? They won't typically say that unless they're seeking answers. Then they will. They will absolutely, but they won't come and say, my life is on the wrong track. You know, um, it's so-and-so's fault. It's so-and-so's fault. It's, it's the fault of this. They'll come and say, my life is, my life is not going in, in a direction that I would like it to go. And how do I change it? How do I change it? That's a call for trust. That's a call for trust in the self. How do I build the trust within myself to manifest a life? conducive to the resolution of karma and, and, and the, res, the realization of peace. How do I? How do I mend that bridge within my own self? It's a big deal. And it's not easy. It's not overnight. It's not 10 years or 20 years. It's not probably even a single lifetime. It's lifetimes. So grateful that Hinduism has reincarnation as a centerpiece because we get thousands, maybe millions of lifetimes to work this stuff out, you know? We do. I don't know about you, though. I don't want to have to go through this every single lifetime. <laughs> no, no, no. So I'm going to do the work now so that the next life that I'm living, it's a different situation. 
Will it be a better situation? I don't know. Could be a worse situation. Could be setting myself up for even more. I don't know. It's going to be what it's going to be. But I'm going to do everything in my power, you know, in this life, everything that I can to have a deep thread of trust within myself for myself, but also for that divinity that has chosen to put me here. And so I just say every single day, I say, whatever you want. The only thing I ask is that you make it obvious so that I'm not sitting in my human mind going, did it mean that or did it mean that? Don't let me waste my time with, with that. Just point me in a direction and kick. <laughs> Just make it obvious. And sometimes it's really super obvious and other times it's not at all, you know. And it's so funny because when it's obvious, it's so easy. But when it's not obvious, it's so irritating. So irritating. So trust. What are some things you can do to, to build trust in yourself? Is spend time with yourself. Listening to yourself. Write down what you think. So take 30 minutes. And in that 30 minutes, have a, have a journal open in front of you. <laughs> You're smiling, Savannah. You've done this. Yeah. Write down every thought that comes across your mind. Indiscriminately. So don't just write down the pretty ones. Write down every single thing you think. Why do I have to write down this stupid sentence? Oh, my God. My back hurts. Oh, man. That situation this morning pissed me off. Oh, I don't like this color on me. Do you think my hair looks okay? Whatever it is, every single thought you have, just, just you know, scribble it quick because that's how quick the thoughts come. Then when you're done, close the book, sit quietly for five minutes, just breathe. Maybe take 10 minutes, go have a sip of water, go for a walk, come back, open the book, read it and cross out everything that's not true. Now, what is truth? What is absolute? I don't look good in blue. That's not true. My back hurts. Not anymore, it doesn't. Cross that out. You know? I, I'm not worth anything. Cross that out. Cross out everything that isn't true. And I can pretty much guarantee you, if you have one sentence left on that line, you're doing pretty darn good. Yeah. And if you have two, pfft. You're leaps and bounds ahead of the game. And if you have three, oh my God, you had a moment of realization, you know? But odds are, for most people, every single line on that will be crossed out. So what does that tell us? It tells us that our thoughts are working against us most of the time. It tells us that our thoughts are undercutting trust in our own self. So what do we do? Well, we have to adjust our thought process. So you keep doing that type of an exercise in some way, shape, or form until you begin to realize. And then when a thought arises, you immediately say, this thought is not true. In yoga, it's called neti neti. Mm -hmm. Not this, not this. Right? This is kind of like the entry level of neti neti. Neti neti can be taken up some steps, boy. Until it's, it's actually a process of renunciation. It's like, you know, neti neti, this is not God. Neti neti, this is not God. This physical body, neti neti, this is not God. You know, this alone is not God. It's only when I see everything with equanimity that I actually see God. As long as I separate out and I say, you know, we have Cindy... We have Amber, we have Ian, we have individual. Then I'm only seeing the individual. Neti neti. No, no. I see you all together as one light. This is God. Yeah. So we start on a real practical level. And the thought comes in the mind and, you know, they never make my coffee right when I come through the drive. No, that's just not true, you know. So you just laugh at that thought and let it go. That will start to build trust if you do it consistently enough. It'll build trust. It'll build trust in your ability to think clearly. 
to see rationally, to understand what's actually going on. And then eventually you cultivate thoughts. And this is the power of mantra. Mantra, man, tra. Man means mind, tra means tool. This is one of the ways. It's it's one of the ways. There's probably five or six that it's translated, but that's a very important one. Man, mind, comes from manas. Tra, tool. The mantra works the mind. It gives you something to think about other than all of these thoughts that drive you crazy all the time. I'm always, I'm always mm, humored. I will provide someone with mantra diksha. It's a formalized mantra practice. It's, uh, it's entering into a student-teacher relationship that's um, a lofty relationship. And they'll chant their mantra for a while. And eventually they'll come back to me and they'll say, well, I've been doing that for, I don't know, six months, nine months. Yeah. Is there another mantra? I don't know. I'm feeling kind of weird lately. I'm feeling like I'm distracted. Do you have a, is there a mantra I can do for that? And I'm like, nope. Do more. <sighs> all you need is one mantra. That's all. You know, we teach so many mantras. We do. We have courses in mantras. We teach so many of them. But the reality is you only need one. So why do we teach so many of them? We teach so many of them because you're always going to want another one. Or at least most students will always want another one. So we just indulge because we know that mantra is a tool for the mind. It's a tool to direct the mind, to focus the mind, to replace some of those thoughts that drive you crazy half the time, most of the time. But eventually, you hone it down to a mantra. Could be Om Namah Shivaya, could be Om Sri Durgaya Namaha, could be Om. Just one mantra. And you say that over and over and over again. And when you have a moment of fear, you start chanting the mantra. When you get in your car to drive your, to work, you start chanting the mantra. When you're cooking your food, you start chanting the mantra. Whatever you're doing. You're having flashback, you start chanting the mantra. You just keep chanting the mantra. And the mantra builds trust in the self because the mantra is clear. It's not confused. The mantra is clear. It is straightforward. The mantra is the realm of divinity. It's the realm of that divine consciousness. It's not the realm of the ego. So it's clear. And so the more that you abide in the mantra, the less confused. The more you abide in the mantra, the more trust. So chant more. Think less. Chant a lot more. Think a lot less. And you'll find that you'll feel stronger in yourself. Absolutely. Stronger in yourself. I've had students who have come back after just a week. Not even. They receive their mantra diksha. They come back a week later and they're like, I can't, I, I just can't, I don't have words for the changes already. And just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Because yoga, in all of its facets, is the first thing that a person will pick up when they believe they are broken or hurt in some way. And it is the first thing that they will put down the moment they start feeling better. It's like, no, 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 don't put it down. Now is when you need it. Just because you're feeling better doesn't mean you're fixed. It's the ego. Yeah, the ego comes forward and says, oh, you're doing so good. Pat you on the back. Look at how, look, you've had a self-realization. You are elevated. Your soul is so bright. You don't need to sit for an hour. So they call, they say, Swamini, do I really need to still sit for an hour? I'm like, now you need to sit for two. <laughs> you got to be careful. It's a slippery slope. You know, it really is. Now, what if, like, you get into that and it's going good, and but then instead of that wanting to be lazy, you want to keep pushing and pushing and pushing farther and farther and farther and farther? Because that's my experience with it. Yeah. I just want to keep going until forever. <laughs> yeah. So there's there's two ways that you, at a minimum, that you can look at that. The first, that's fine. Keep going. What else are you going to do? Go back to old habits? 
you know? So uh, is it going to hurt you? No, of course not. Well, <coughs> no, probably not. No, probably not. So, so better to do more of your sadhana than to revert. But just always be aware. The moment that the sadhana becomes uh, a bragging point or starts cultivating pride within oneself, um, becomes a comparative tool, I'm doing this, you're not, then we know that it's actually the ego that wants to keep going forward. When, when the cities become the focus and not the practice and the connection itself, then you know it's the ego. You know. when, it, when it becomes about a power grab, it's the ego. And so then you don't stop doing your practice, but you orient it toward something simple so that there's nothing for the ego to become fertilized in. You know? So you make it simple. You just sit and you meditate. And they say in all of, of the scriptures that actually talk about it, they say, you know, the cities, you know what the cities are because you're shaking your heads. Yes, these are the perfections or the, the, the special abilities, as it were. And a lot of yogis along the path, they get really caught up in these things, being able to see the future, to know the past, to become big as a mountain, small as an atom, to bend things to their will, all these, to attract people, to repulse people, all these, these, these things. They, they look at it and say, oh, these are such special powers. I, I've, I've made it. It's like, no, you haven't. Nope, nope, nope. This is the quicksand pit. And you have to be really careful because you're stepping in it. You know, This is the pile of dog poo. Okay, so now you got it on your shoe. You know, Time to stop and take the shoe off. Wash it off and, and get yourself clean again. You know? Ask for someone to throw you a rope so you can pull yourself out of the quicksand because it will pull you down. It'll bring you right back into the realm of the ego. Humility is huge in yoga. Humility is absolutely huge. And humility also plays an important role in trust because one must be humble in order to allow others to walk the path they have to walk you have to be humble if if there's not humility there it's very difficult there's a strong sense of should be wouldn't be could be right and the more that we understand and i just want to say also because the spiritual bypassing is no laughing matter. It's such a problem in the world today. We talk about this. I'm not saying that people should not be responsible for their behavior. They should be. If someone commits a crime, they should go to jail. They should do something rehabilitative to fix themselves. You know? Somebody, somebody hurts you seriously. Somebody commits murder. Of course they should pay for it. Somebody hurts you significantly. Of course they should face the consequences of society in whatever way that's meant. But society should not be so punitive as to steal from that individual the possibility of their own potential toward goodness. Mm-hmm. Right? So we have a punitive system. We do not have a rehabilitative system in this country. We throw people in jail and we lock them away and we throw away the key. We don't oftentimes say this individual can actually have rehabilitation. Maybe they can once again be, you know, a a well-managed member of society without the fear of them harming someone. So as a community, as a society, we need to put a bit more thought into that. We really do. We need to, to start looking at the impact that our systems have on people's overall potential. And here's just one little example. So back in the day, many, many, many moons ago, many, many moons ago, you know, I didn't see anything wrong with smoking a joint. But I could have gone to jail for it. My parents could have lost the house. If they found even one seed 
of marijuana in the house. This was a law that they passed for a period of time in New Jersey. One seed and your parents could lose everything that they owned because you were their child and you were doing something illegal. Is it illegal in New Jersey now? No, not at all. But between then and now, how many people's lives have been turned upside down? How many people went to jail? How many people lost everything, their homes, their bank accounts, their ability to take care of their family? How many people lost their children for something that is no longer deemed an issue? See, we're fickle. That's the point that I'm trying to make, is that we're fickle. And by the way, no, I don't indulge anymore, and I stopped doing that 35 years ago. But whatever, maybe 40 now. Um, But we're fickle. We say one thing matters one day, and the next day it doesn't really matter at all. And people's lives are ruined because of it. So we need to put more thought into what it is to be a rehabilitative society. Now, of course, there are people who are beyond rehabilitation, and that's sad, and it's unfortunate. But there is a way to care for them also. There is a way. There is a way. It's a difficult way. But there's a way. Boy, we touched on a lot of really sensitive subjects today, didn't we? Oh, Lord. Let's just close the eyes for a moment. Take a breath. Take another one. And another. Let yourself soften. Soften into the space. Soften into the moment. Soften into the potential of trusting yourself. And then gently flutter the eyes open. You are strong enough. You are. Another thing that um, many people don't enjoy hearing is the universe will never give you anything you can't handle. I heard that. (laughs) I heard that. We don't like that. Matter of fact, I had a student one time come up to me after Wisdom Circle a few years ago. And they, they were literally, they were upset with me. And they said, I, I can't stand when people say that. It's, it's so demeaning. And I said, well, can you explain that to me? Why is it demeaning? What does it mean to you? I said, well, I just don't think it's right. I said, no, no, no. I said, that, that's fine. You don't have to think it's right. But can you explain to me why? Can you, can you tell me right now one thing in your life, just one thing, anybody in this room, tell me one thing in your life that has come to you that you have not dealt with. Do you have anything? How about you? Tell me one thing you have not dealt with. Savannah? Anything? Maybe. I don't know. A lot of things. That you have not dealt with. Yeah. At all. Yeah. Yeah. Anything? Of course. There's nothing that you will that you that will not be dealt with. You may not like how you're dealing with it, but you'll deal with it. Mm-hmm. You, you Right. You might sweep it under the rug. You might deny it. <laughs> it does. Absolutely. It's a strategy. It's completely a strategy. Sweep it under the rug. Yes, 100%. It's a strategy. Of course, it's going to come back out from under the rug. And at some point, you'll sweep so much under there, there'll be this little pile, you know, and you'll be like, oh, I got to clean that under the rug. You know, 
no matter what it is, you have dealt with everything that has come your way and you will continue to do so. And most of it, you won't like the way you deal with it, but you'll do the best you can with the tools you believe you have in any given moment. So when we say the universe will never send you anything you can't deal with, it's the truth of the matter. It's just the truth. Yeah, but I don't like it most of the time. Well, that's a different matter. That's a different subject. That's totally different. That's preference. That's saying, I don't want it to rain again today. I want it to be sunny. And the universe, raining. Yeah. But what happens if it rains? Well, then you get out your umbrella and your... your Galoshes. Galoshes. They have a brand of galoshes in Ireland called Swamp Masters. <laughs> I bought one. Yeah. Swamp Masters. And you sound like you're in love with them. I am. <laughs> I've never bought a pair of rain boots or muck boots that I really loved. Right? Like, I've, I've always wanted to get a really good pair, but... And I've gotten one or two, and I've just, they've sat there, you know, so I end up donating them or giving them to my daughter or something. But we have the property next door, and there's a lot of wet over there. So I went out, and I got this just this cheap little pair of boots. They were on sale under the season or something, and I love them. They're so full of mud and muck. But then this last trip to Ireland, I was going through a store there called Joyce's, and right there in front of me, Swamp Master. And I was like, Holy cow. <laughs> it's so much fun. It really is. Did you get it? No, but I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to. You know, and, and I can say to you honestly that it's only been the last 30 years, and I'm 60, so it's only been the last 30 years that progressively because of these practices, because of these practices supporting the growth and the building of trust within my own self, that I've been able to take such deep, profound joy in such silly little things as Swamp Master Monk Boots <laughs> and walking through the marshlands on an entirely rainy day, drenched to the bone and still just loving that moment of it there was most definitely another day in my life where I would have been miserable. I'm like, oh my God, I'm wet. Ah, who wants muck boots? They're not sexy, you know. <laughs> but the more that you cultivate the trust within yourself, and that's the, that's the divine gift of this, the more you cultivate that trust, that clarity within yourself, the more you do see the joy in each and every moment no matter how silly, small, or huge it happens to be. And that's what I wish for each and every one of you, that you just keep growing in that direction and that you have faith that you can and you will. So our time is up for today. Any last-minute questions or reflections? Yeah? I think just to repeat the definition of trust, because we were I think we have a, I think we have to make a new definition. Although I think that what Cindy said was very close. Would you repeat what you said? That I have to I don't know if I can remember it correctly, but trust to me is believing that what is happening is what is meant to happen and I just need to embrace it. And Savannah, what would you define trust as? Feeling safe within yourself. Safe within yourself. Good. Yeah, I I guess. (laughs) (laughs) I think it's great. I love it. Absolutely. Safe within yourself. It says nothing about the outside world because we can't. But within the self, we can. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's sit tall and close the eyes. And draw the hands together in front of the heart. And we'll chant one Om and the All Beings Mantra with the intention and the hope 
that we should all have that trust within ourselves. Taking a breath in. Om Loka Samasta Suki no Bhavantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bhavantu Loka Samasta Suki no Bhavantu Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om Now and always honoring your light and the light of all beings everywhere. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. Thank you all so much for being here today. So wonderful to gather with each and every one of you. Thank you for all of your input and wonderful question today. Thank you, Savannah. Absolutely. So if you haven't had brunch yet, they are still serving downstairs. I hope you enjoy, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Be well. Thank you.